Journey IFC strives to create safe spaces to worship God. Know that you are welcome just as you are, regardless of religious background or lack thereof, skin color, political affiliation, sexuality, age, culture, or any other label you own or society throws on you. You are welcomed and celebrated here just as you are. Our reading, oh, I'm Gail. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Our reading comes from a threshold period in Jesus' life found in Luke chapter 2. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. And after the festival is over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, oh, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you all over the place. <laughs> And Jesus says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And Mary said, get yourself into that caravan right now before I tell you what I know. Oh wait, she didn't say that. <laughs> but, but in the end, of course, they're walking home and his parents are thinking this over and they don't really quite understand what he meant right there when he said, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother, treasure, pondered all these things in her heart. And Jesus himself grew in wisdom and stature, growing in grace and favor with God and everyone else. That was a fun reading, thank you. <laughs> that was an angry. I was into that. So sure. Yeah. <laughs> we should have clapped. Yeah. Right? Yes, you should, yes, so we clapped and ran the clap. So when I hear this story, I think back to being a kid, and I was left at church quite a lot, not on purpose, on accident. Um, my parents just simply forgot me. They got to lunch, and they weren't the ones to remember me. It was a family friend, Beth, who remembered me. Came and picked me up, and then took me to lunch with my family. So when I hear this story, I'm like, I, I get it. I get it. So today we're taking uh, the next step in this threshold crossing journey that we've been talking about. And like I said, we've been, you know, we left behind some stuff, some baggage, as we talked about the Adam and Eve story and how they were booted from the garden. Uh, we also journeyed with the, you know, Israelites out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, up to that threshold, right before they were about to cross the water, you know, when Moses splits the sea. We didn't even get to that part, we just got right up to it. Um, and that was right at the point when they started questioning whether they were doing the right thing whether it was worth crossing this threshold, they should have just gone back home and stayed slaves. That was what we talked about last week, and we were reminded from the words of Moses to not be afraid, to stand firm, and to see what God is doing in our lives. And today, we're gonna be right in the midst of that threshold. We're standing right in it today. We're no longer in the past, not yet in the future, just firmly in the now. And so before I get too far into all that you know, Bible stuff, I'm gonna talk about some other Bible stuff, I guess. Um, I actually want to share some photos with y'all uh, and some stories from my recent trip to Israel because um, uh, I think it'll help with our story. It gives some, just some cool pictures. I took them, so you might as well see them. Um, and honestly, I'm just so excited to tell anyone about this trip, and I really am eager to tell y'all about it and share some of the wisdom I gained along the way. Uh, but I also want to say thank you to Journey because um, Journey did give me some financial support through a sabbatical fund that I got to use. So part of that money went to, to help me 
go on this trip. So it was a gift to me, and so I hope it can be a gift back to the community. Um, so thank you, I just wanna say that. Um, so let's go to the, the first picture. We're gonna be talking about the story where Jesus went to the temple. Um, and so you can see the bottom picture is the one I took. The other one is cartoon, so I did not take that one. Um, it's really hard to see in the sliding, but uh, you can kind of see this big wall here, and there's a golden dome. Um, so that is the uh, Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That's what it looks like. Um, and so the Temple Mount was a mountain um, that was Solomon built a temple there, whole church history. First temple was destroyed, and then Herod came in and built an even more extravagant temple. Um, and so that hill became this huge plaza. They, they made this artificial hill that kind of expanded out further. Um, and so it's this huge thing, and, and where the that golden dome is there. It's called the Dome of the Rock. Um, that's actually a mosque. And so that's where um, the temple used to be. Again, it's really political. It's a really contentious space. Um, now it's a mosque, and there's some rules around that and what that looks like. Um, but this was my view from the Mount of Olives. So if you're familiar with the Easter story when Jesus is coming down on Palm Sunday, we are about to walk on what they call the Palm Sunday Walk or Trail, um, which is down this mountain. Um, they are like, we don't know where Jesus actually walked, but it was somewhere around here. This is just where we walk as we remember that. Um, so this was my view of the, the Temple Mount. This was my first take at it um, before we even got to go to it. Um, in the top picture, you can see this is, so the bottom one, we're looking at the um, eastern wall up here. That's actually the western wall, so it's kind of flipped. Um, but this is what it would have looked like during Jesus' time. It was very different. Um, same general structure, but it had this big temple in the middle um, where all of their um, holy spaces were. And let's, let's go to the next slide. Um, this was a, a small scale version of the entire thing. I went to a museum um, and got to see it. And I, you can't really see it here, so I have another picture, but I just wanted to show it was super cool. We just got to walk around it and it was too scale accurate of what it would have looked like during Jesus' time. So go to the next one. So this is, a, this is what the temple would have been. You can kind of see how there's these layers. It's this big rectangular courtyard area, and everyone was allowed into that. That was kind of the Gentile area. And then it became more exclusive every layer you got. And so women were only allowed in a certain area. Business was allowed in a certain area, but once you came deeper in and deeper in, then it was just the men, and then it was just the priests, and then there was the Holy of Holies, which was where only the high priest could go once a year. Um, and so you can see it's very different now. Um, this has been destroyed and been changed, and we don't know exactly where it stood precisely, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but I, when Jesus was going with his family to this Passover celebration, this is where he was going. Um, and some people think that actually over to the, the left on those stairs is actually where Jesus was talking with uh, the teachers. We don't know. That's just a guess. So let's go to the next photo. Here's uh, another depiction of what it looks like inside the temple. So it even gets smaller and smaller. And way in the back is the Holy of Holies, uh, which was a, a really small space. This is where they thought, you know, the Ark of the Covenant was to be kept. This was um, God's footstool. It's where God and heaven and earth met in this space is what they thought. And that's still what Jews to this uh, day believe, is that this is God's footstool. This is where heaven and earth meet. And so this was super holy ground. And so this is where they were coming. This is why they made the trip here. Um, and, it, and it's interesting, um, it being on a mount, uh, the Temple Mount, anytime Jews say they're going to um, go to the city of Jerusalem, they're always going up to the city. They go Allah. They make Allah, which means in Hebrew, to go up. And so they're all going up these hills to get to this holy place uh, of theirs. So let's go to the next one. This is... Um, on the other side, so again, that's the Dome of the Rock, uh, which is that mosque, it's about where the temple would have been. Um, and this is a, a photo of what is considered the Western Wall. Um, so this is where it uh, used to be called the Wailing Wall, which is actually kind of a derogatory term for it, because um, many women would go there and weep for the destruction of the temple. Um, and so really, it's, it's called the Western Wall. And this is a, a holy place. It's the holiest place for Jewish people. It's the number one holiest place for Jewish people, is this wall. Um, and the idea is that um, on the Temple Mount, um, it's kind of contentious. Um, it is now a Muslim space. Um, and so 
Jews are allowed to go up there, but they're not allowed to pray up there. And the idea is that you don't want to accidentally step where the Holy of Holies was. And so it's a risk. If you go up there, you could actually go on a holy place that you're not allowed to go. And so the Western Wall is the closest place they can get to where they can touch the wall and pray and remember the temple as they knew it. Um, so go to the next photo. So this is what the wall looks like. Um, and this is the original stone. Um, up to like, I think the seventh layer is the from whenever Herod was uh, king. So from Jesus's time. And when you go up to the rocks, you see people putting their head, hands on it. Some people put, um, they'll write a prayer and paper. That's a pretty new tradition, yeah. um, but they'll do that. I did it as well. You can even see them. Um, and so you go up to the stones and they're smooth from all of the hands that have touched them throughout. Yeah. There's too. It's yeah. Darker. Yeah, you can see it's darker where hands have been. And it, it just reminds you that how old this is. We don't really have that old of stuff, you know, buildings in the U.S. Yeah. And it's such a strange thing to go and touch something that was there wow. when Jesus was in, in, that, uh, in that area. So let's go to the next photo. I'm probably going to forget all my, I have all these notes and I'm just not looking at them. <laughs> so um, while we were there, um, we got to go to the Western Wall and it's gendered. So there's the men's section and the women's section. Um, and it split um, for the Orthodox Jews there, um, which was a strange feeling for me. I put my prayer was um, your kingdom come because I was like, this is a weird feeling. I don't know how I feel about being gendered here. Um, but then to the right of that, kind of down some steps, um, there's an area called the egalitarian area, and it's where men and women can go. It's not completely touch the wall, but it's the closest you can get to the wall, and men and women can pray. And so um, that evening, it was actually Epiphany. It was on Epiphany that I was there, right when I took this picture. And we welcomed in the Sabbath, um, the Shabbat service. Um, and so the rabbi led us in that, and we sang and we danced. Um, and we just got to kind of look at the wall and think about it. Um, but as I looked up, I saw there was birds that were kind of coming and going, and that there's these plants that were overflowing from it. And it just reminded me, we have all these boundaries, these rules, these thresholds that, you know, we cross, don't cross. Um, but nature doesn't obey those rules. And I just thought it was a really striking imagery of seeing these plants kind of overgrowing, saying, you can't tell me where I came. And I <laughs> yeah, there's barbed wire plants. Yeah, there's barbed wire. There's, yeah, there's a lot of that there. So the reason I want to show you these pictures of this is because it's a real place. It's really where Jesus went. He was in the town of Nazareth. He wanted to go with his family. It was the, the custom of the people to go to make Allah, to go up, to ascend to this holy city. And so they went here for the Passover, which is actually what we mentioned last week with the Exodus story. Passover is when the Jewish people remember the flight out of uh, slavery when they couldn't even wait for the bread to rise. And, and so they remember that every year. They remember this, this time when they had to flee. So Jesus went with his family, as was their family custom, to go to this city of gold, as it's called, or the city on the hill. They were approaching what they believed, and they still believed to be God's footstool, the holiest place they could go. And at this time, Jesus was around 12 years of age, um, and he was taken to this holy city, like his family always did. And it was this time of ritual and community and connection. Everyone went. It was a big thing to go. And it was this celebration to remember what had happened in the Exodus story and how they were flee free from slavery, how they were liberated. And so they traveled several days. It's not an easy trip. It's in desert regions. It's up these big hills. And they're traveling with this huge group of people. Because at this time, going through that desert region was really dangerous. Um, there were a lot of robbers that would come, and if you were alone, they would steal from you, they would often kill you. And so people would travel in these huge caravans because it was safer to do that. And so um, what they did is to protect the women and children, they put the women and children kind of in the inner parts of it, and then the men would be on the outside to protect. That was kind of how they did that. Um, and so Jesus is 12 at this time. Around kind of the age of puberty, if he was, you know, a modern Jew, that would be around the time you get bar mitzvahed. Um, that, that didn't happen in Jesus' time. That was not a tradition then. But this was whenever they believed that boys were becoming men. So it's that kind of threshold period that Jesus had. And it's an interesting threshold because although he's now a man, he's far from adulthood, uh, but he's also no longer just a child in their eyes. Um, he's changing, he's growing. And this may explain why Jesus was left behind in this story. 
there's this large caravan packed up. They're they're heading home. They've done this you know whole Passover week, and uh, they're tired. They're just ready to get home. They have several days of journey to walk. And you can just imagine Mary and Joseph each you know split up on this walk, thinking Jesus was with the other parent. And I'm thinking, okay, well, Joseph was probably like, well, you know, he's just a boy. He's probably with his mother still. That's that's safe. That makes sense. And. Mary's probably thinking, oh, how sweet. Jesus is growing up. He wants to be with the men. He must be with his dad. All the while, Jesus was back at the Temple Mount, learning from scholars and teachers of the time. And it says that it takes them three days to find Jesus, because they have to walk a day's journey, walk back, search from around. And having been to Jerusalem myself now, I can see that it would take a long time to get somewhere. It was really narrow alleyways. All the buildings kind of looked the same. It felt like a maze to me. And it's great crowds everywhere. It's just, especially at this time when it was the Passover, it was so many people. So you can imagine they're just frantically looking, having no idea where to go. It's so, it's so funny, because you know, we were, I know we were reading uh, the passage earlier, and then, you know, they say that, like, they didn't know where Jesus was and everything. And I'm thinking in my head, like, like, well, didn't they just look in the back seat and know where he was? <laughs> and so me, I'm, like, picturing all these things, and, like, then they're like, oh, we've got to go back. So they make a U-turn and go yep. back. And, like... Yeah, and do they turn the whole caravan around? <laughs> no, it's like I'm, I like I was picturing like something completely different, and then the fact that you just said it was a long journey walk, and I'm thinking like, oh, yeah, that's it makes, right. It makes sense that it took them three days to yeah, find him. Like, when we hear that, we're like, what it's terrible so great to look in the back seat and notice, like. <laughs> Yeah, so they go back to see, and they're like searching everywhere to yeah. find him. Like, it makes sense that they could not find him. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Jesus was like completely lost to them, and he was stuck alone, a 12 year old. I can't imagine being 12, stuck in Jerusalem alone, in this threshold period of his own, on the like verge of adulthood, in a place that was even considered a threshold place for them. It was. This is where heaven and earth met. This was where God's footstool was. This was a threshold. So Jesus, on the threshold of his life, was in this threshold as well. And what did he do in this threshold crossing journey? He stopped and he started talking to people. He got to know them. He learned some new things. He stayed in that holy place. They went all around the city and he was at the Temple Mount the whole time. He didn't wander the streets as far as we know. Instead, he focused and took the time to prepare for the changes that he was facing at that time. If it was anything like puberty for me, that's an awful time. <laughs> he was really happy to prepare for some things, and he's doing it in a very mature way, which is surprising. And it's interesting, we don't get a lot of story about Jesus' childhood, at least not in the books we have in the Bible as we know it today. So this is a very important story. It gives us a glimpse at who Jesus was as a young adult, before even being an adult, honestly. And it, and it gives us a view of what Jesus was like before his ministry began in the world. And so we get to see Jesus as a student, as a kid, on this threshold of adulthood. And so it makes me wonder how we stand in our personal thresholds of life. All the ones that we are facing on our own or as a community in the world. What is the big thing that is staring us in the face and calling us forward? What shift are we feeling or going through in our lives, in our world, in our heads? What is it? How are we coming of age yet again, even at whatever age we are? And what do we do when we find ourselves in the midst of this transition period, when things feel less familiar and it seems like the world's axis has shifted somehow? How do we stay present and walk through our next threshold? Well, I'm going to turn to this story, I guess, and suggest that we could be like preteen Jesus and live fully into this in-between space, fighting off the instincts to, to be afraid, to, to fear what is happening, the unknown, the, the all of that up-in-the-air stuff, and instead we can embrace the beauty in that and learning new things about ourselves, the world, all of that as well. We can find community and wisdom from teachers like Jesus did, who may have walked through similar thresholds as the ones we have faced. And then we can finally, when we've had enough and it's time to go home or when our parents show back up and finally find us, we can grab hold of those we love and who love us and we can step forward a new people. 
It's an ancient story we have here. From the Garden of Eden to the Exodus out of Egypt, and now to young Jesus, and even to us today, we can experience this story. Each of these threshold stories reveals this pattern in our lives and in humanity, showing us that we are meant to change and grow and walk through these thresholds. There's something so utterly human about this idea. And it can happen to us as children or even as adults. We never stop learning. And it seems to happen over and over and over again. So therefore, what we are learning in this current threshold, the skills that we have gained now, we get to use for the next threshold. What we learned from the last threshold crossing will inform the next th crossing, and, and we'll get, inform the next one, and then the next one. We get to keep these tools that we're gaining. And, and this is the photo that I go to when I think about that threshold space. When we're sitting there welcoming in the Shabbat, the day of rest, and the egalitarian part that didn't exist before, that was created so that men and women could be together, this threshold space being changed and growing and becoming something new, these plants growing over the edge, the flowers just kind of cascading around. I wish you could see the color, it was nice like pink coming down. I just think of Jesus's time here in Jerusalem and how it was this big transformative thing for him, this big moment where he was different, where his family saw him in new light, where he was becoming a man of sorts. And I think of how he was changing and crossing over like that. And I think we're called to do that same thing as well. So we may be inspired by young Jesus this week as we face whatever it is we face, or we could be inspired by these plants and birds that go where they go, where they grow and, and they, they don't limit themselves to boundaries and stay on one side of the wall. So may we look for what we can do to cross the threshold, to be present in this threshold, but also let us look forward as we prepare to step beyond it and see where God is leading us. We need to re realize that thresholds are not necessarily what we think that they are. We cross them all the time without even realizing they're there. Thresholds can be something that separates, something that transitions. They can also be markers. Cherish every threshold. But the one thing that's in common with every threshold that we cross, it's always big enough for two. Go this week in peace, knowing that you don't crash, cross up any threshold by yourself. Your creator is there loving you and walking with you at the same time. Go in peace.